Well, hello, and here we are once again at the end of another series. We've covered the battle in our mind, the taming of our tongues, various trials, resisting temptation, sexual morality, welcome and acceptance, giving thanks, sharing faith, unity, and loving others. All subjects centered around this thought that we are switched on and getting brighter, centered on this thought that Jesus can transform us to be more like him so that we can shine brighter in this world to show a different way of living, a kingdom way of living. And as we come to the conclusion of the series, we come to a subject that uh, holds it all together and enables it, our love for God. I'm sure many of you over the course of the last few weeks as we have focused on loving others have come to that reality of the truth that we can only love others because of the love that God, that he has given to us. As 1 John 4, 11 to 12 tells us, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. As God loves us, so we ought to love one another. And if we love one another, then God, who is love, lives in us. And that's how people see God, by our love for one another. In other words, as we receive love from God, and allow his love to dwell in us, then that in turn enables us to love others and for others to see God in us. Now, whether that's inside the local church or in the wider church family or to those not yet of the community of believers. I'm sure many of you will have been asking in your life groups that question of how can we know more of God's love in our lives so that we can love others better. And how does God love us? Well, that is a series in itself and it would be a marvellous thing to study how God loves us. 1 John 4, 8 tells us that God is love. Not only does God love, but love is who God is. Therefore, he cannot but love. It's part of his nature. Romans 5.8 tells us that God demonstrated his love towards us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There are limitless expressions of God's perfect, unconditional love for us all through the scriptures. God has revealed his love to us in sending his only son, Jesus Christ, to provide salvation for those who believe. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God reveals his love to us through salvation, that free gift to those who will receive it, an expression of that love that includes eternal life. Ephesians 2, 8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. God reveals his love to us through the calling and the gifts that he has given to us. Ephesians 2 tells us that we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God reveals his love for us by making us part of his family. As 1 John 3, 1 uh, says, and, and hear this, brothers and sisters, this is wonderful. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. 
wonderful, marvellous truth. So many examples could be provided to show how God loves us. We haven't even scratched the surface. There is the, his compassion to us, his mercy towards us, his forgiveness, his peace, the hope that he gives us, the pastures that he allows us to lie down in, his protection, his provision. We could go on and on and on. And the only adequate reason to explain why God loves us is that it's found in his very nature. He is love and his love for us as his created beings ultimately is to bring glory to his name. And when we think of how God loves us, then our response is surely one of love as after all, 1 John 4, 19 summarizes, we love because he first loved us. Our love to him is a response of his love to us. And the question I want to ask this morning is not how can we receive uh, love more from God, but how can we love God more? Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Loving God starts in our heart. Matthew 22 tells us, Jesus tells us in verse 37, that the first and greatest commandment is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. In Mark 12, 30, that first and greatest commandment to love God is recorded like this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Some have tagged this command as the all command because of the repetition of the word all before uh, what we are to love God with. In other words, there is no room here for divided affections or allegiance. As Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will devote it to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And love for God does have brilliant benefits. It allows us to enjoy God's sustained favour. Moses said in Deuteronomy 7, 9, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generation of those who love him and keep his commands. Paul also said in Romans 8, 28, And we know that in all things God works for the, go for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. The commonality between these two verses is the favour of God to those who love him. The keeping of his commands, the fulfilling his purpose to which he has called us are both expressions of that love for him. Love for God doesn't just mean to have affections for. It is the Greek word agape. To agape love someone is a choice. It is to choose to see them in a favourable light, to choose to delight in them, to choose to faithfully act on their path. It's a wholehearted, self-sacrificing love. And when we agape love God, we see him as the honourable one, the true one, the loving one. We trust him and respond to that trust with obedience. And to love God with all of our heart, and all of our soul, and all of our might, and all of our strength, essentially means loving God with our whole being, in every possible way, with everything we've got, all of the time. But this seems impossible to fulfil completely, because in the natural state of man, it is impossible. No, there is no greater evidence of the inability of man to obey God's law than this one command to love him 
with everything we've got for all for every single moment of the day no human being with a fallen nature can possibly love god with all of his heart and all of his soul and all of his mind and all of his strength 24 hours a day seven days a week 365 days a year is humanly impossible and we know that to disobey any command of god is sin therefore even without considering the sins that we commit daily we are condemned by our inability to fulfill this one command this first and greatest command we need to see and recognize our utter spiritual bankruptcy and our desperate need of a savior without the cleansing of sin that he provides in the empowering presence of his spirit who lives in the hearts of the redeemed loving god to any degree is impossible Matthew Green says in his commentary in the book of Matthew, no one has ever loved God with all of his being, so nobody can possibly merit eternal life. Once again, it brings us back to grace. If we are to have any place in the kingdom of God, it will be due to the unmerited grace of God for sinners who could never make it by themselves. 1 John 4.10 spells it out for us this is love not that we loved god but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins god desires to have that intimate love relationship with us our love for him is a response to his divine love for us Just like two people in love, we express our love for God by spending time in his presence, enjoying his nearness, listening to his voice, reading his word and daily seeking to know him better. As the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, 3, but whoever loves God is known by God. We also express our love for him in doing what he asks. As Jesus told his disciples and therefore us, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commands. But even then, Jesus knows that we can't do that on our own. So he continues, verses 16 and 17, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. We can't truly love God without God's love in our lives uh, and God's help in the person of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. We need God's love to dwell in us in order to love him the way that he desires and to love him in the way as a choice that we make, to love him in a way that is a choice that we make. 1 John 4, 19 again, we love because he first loved us. So how can we love God? How do we express our love for God? There is this call to love God with everything we've got and we can't just dismiss it out of hand as saying it's not possible because even in our fallen nature, God has shed abroad his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit and given us the Holy Spirit to help us love him. So there's no excuse not to pursue that first and greatest commandment to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind. But how do we do that? Well, perhaps one of the great purest examples in the Bible of showing love for God comes from an unnamed woman who anointed the Lord's feet with her perfume. So let's read that passage together as found in Luke 7 verses 36 to 50 and today Ruth is going to read God's word to us. The reading today is from Luke chapter 7 verses 36 to 50. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. 
When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he cancelled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt cancelled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Amen. Amen, and may God add a blessing to the reading of his word. There's just a couple of observations I want to make on this passage. First of all, the unnamed woman who wept at the feet of Jesus, who wiped his feet with her hair, who kissed his feet and to poured, uh, then anointed the Lord's feet with her perfume. First thing I want you to notice that she was so grateful, so grateful was she for Christ's forgiveness of her many sins that she poured out her love in an extravagant worship and absolute devotion. This woman appreciated the true worth of her saviour and in humble gratitude, sacrifice and servitude she loved and worship Jesus with her tears, with her hair, with her kisses, with her priceless bottle of perfume. She loved Jesus and loved God with all that she was and everything that she had to offer. The unnamed woman was so grateful for the great undeserving love that Jesus showed her that she loved Jesus with all that she was and everything that she had to offer. And she didn't mind who else was in the room. The only person that mattered was Jesus. Contrast that with Simon, in whose house Jesus was. Listen to what Jesus said to Simon, verses 44 to 46. You did not give me any water for my feet. You did not give me a kiss. You did not put oil on my head. Simon was rebuked by Jesus because of what he did not do. The unnamed woman was commended by Jesus because of what she did do. Simon was happy to invite Jesus into his home. He was happy to listen to Jesus. He's happy to receive love for Jesus and having a meal with him. But express love for him? No. You see, Simon was more concerned with who else was in the room. He was more concerned uh, about what they would think because, you see, Simon had not yet received that revelation of who Jesus 
really was. Verse 39, we find Simon thinking to himself about Jesus. If this man, if this man were a prophet, Simon had not yet come to know who Jesus actually was and receive his love into his life. The unnamed woman, however, had. And this caused an outward expression. You see, we love because he first loved us. Most of us can remember a time when we were, when we fell in love. That passionate, all-consuming, single-minded adoration is the kind of love that God desires from us. The Bible says that King David, the man after God's own heart, had the singular passion for God. Psalm 42 verses 1 and 2 reads, As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, for the living God. When can I go and stand before him? David exemplifies how we are to love God by delighting in praise and worship. Psalm 84 verse 2. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. There's been a song going around my head from Elevation Worship called What Would You Do? And it just asks the question, what would you do if Jesus physically walked into the room? What would we say? What would we pray? What would we praise if Jesus was physically came into the room? And I found it a real challenge because it's forced me to ask, what would I do? What would be my response? Because my response would be based on how much I love him. How much I'm willing to express to him my love for him as a result of how much he has loved me and how much of his love I've received into my own life. Would I be like Simon? Would it be marked by what I did not do? Or would it be like the unnamed woman? marked by what I did do. The unnamed woman wept. She wet the feet of Jesus with her tears. She wiped Jesus' feet with her hair. She kissed them and poured perfume on them. That's what she did when Jesus was in the room. When Jesus went to visit Lazarus, Martha and Mary, it was Mary who chose what was better. She sat at his feet listening to him. That's what she did. When Jesus was in the room. When John on the island of Patmos caught a vision of Jesus, he fell before him as if dead. That's what he did, as it were, when Jesus was in the room. David danced before the Lord with all of his might. That's what he did. And expressions, all expressions of extravagant love for Jesus, love for God, all based on the grace of God towards them, all based on the fact that God loved them first and they received that love into their own lives. That's what they did when they were in the room with Jesus. That's how they showed their love for Jesus. It was marked by what they did. What will we do to show our love for Jesus? Part of the lyric of the song, What Will You Do, says this, The King is in the room. Your healer is in the room. Your saviour's in the room. Your providers in the room. Your redeemers in the room. Your champions in the room. He's in this room. So what will you do? What will you do out of the grace that he's given to you? Out of the love that he has poured out into, your, into you, out of the heartfelt gratitude that you have towards, that he has towards you, out of the mercy you've received, you are no longer a sinner, you're a saint, you're no longer lost, but you are found. You're a child of God. So what will you do? We're going to close by listening to that song, What Will You Do? 
And can I encourage you as you listen to this song, show Jesus how much you love him. Express it to him. Shake off that Scottish reserve. Doesn't matter who else is in the room with you. The only person that matters is Jesus. Let his commendation come to you because of what you do. Jesus knows your heart. So love him out of what is within you. Out of our being comes our doing. And that includes expressing our love for him with all that we are and everything we have to offer him. So let's express our love for him now. Yeah.